Today I'm going to teach you about primitive pottery for beginners. We're going to go through the whole process from defining what primitive pottery is through collecting and processing materials to forming and firing your own pots. The whole process from a beginner's point of view. In this fast-paced, consumer-driven society we live in, we're used to buying things from the store that were made thousands of miles away in a factory overseas. And the raw materials for those products came from even farther away, across another ocean. It seems like nobody these days is in control of the entire supply chain for any product. Well, primitive pottery is the opposite of that. With primitive pottery, the artist is in control of the entire process from collecting raw materials through the finished product. Have you ever heard that thing about how many people it takes to make a pencil? How it takes all these different skill sets and different materials from all over the world to make a simple pencil. The wood comes from one place, the rubber comes from another, the graphite from another, the paint comes from another place. All these things are made in different factories and it all comes together to make a simple pencil. Well, primitive pottery is the antithesis of this. With primitive pottery, the artist collects the raw materials, processes them, forms the pot, and finishes it. So let's get started by defining what primitive pottery is. Primitive pottery can mean different things to different artists. So all primitive pottery means is pottery that is made without the use of any mechanized or electronic equipment. This precludes the use of pottery wheels or electric kilns or anything like that. But different artists approach primitive pottery differently. Some artists use glazes on primitive pottery. Some fire in primitive kilns, others fire on the surface. Some like to use raw materials they collect from the earth. Others like to use store-bought materials. There's a million different ways you could approach primitive pottery. But the main point is it's not made using any mechanized or electronic equipment. Some people take exception with the word primitive, thinking that it puts down people, that we're calling the people that make it primitive or the cultures that made it primitive. And that is far from the truth. All the primitive potters I know have the utmost respect for the native cultures that made pottery like this. The word primitive does not apply to the cultures or the people that made the pottery. It applies to the tools used to make the pottery. I found a good definition for primitive in an old dictionary. It reads like this. Primitive, ancient, original, established from the beginning. So the term primitive refers to ancient, original, established from the beginning, methods of forming pottery, tools for forming pottery. It is not a put down to the people who make it. There's actually a whole group of primitive technology people, at least here in the States. I'm sure there's probably some in Europe and Australia and other places. And these people go around just studying primitive technology. If you go to a primitive skills gathering, you might learn how to tan leather, or you might learn how to weave baskets, and you might learn how to make primitive pottery. It's just another one of those primitive skills that goes along with the way people used to live long ago. Let's talk a little bit now about how we get started making primitive pottery, where the materials come from. Okay, so where do primitive potters get their material? This can be the biggest barrier to entry for somebody trying to get into this as a hobby because they feel like you have to be able to go out and collect wild clay and minerals for paint and those kind of things and make your own materials before you can get started. And sometimes that's a daunting task. Sometimes it's almost impossible, depending on where you live and your particular circumstances. But while wild clay is important to primitive pottery, and most primitive potters work with hand-dug clays and minerals, it isn't what's most important. It isn't what's critical to primitive pottery. What's most important is making the pots by hand, firing them without a kiln, those kind of things. You can work with store-bought materials, and there are many successful primitive potters that work with store-bought materials. Take, for example, the potters down in Mata Ortiz, Chihuahua. Very successful primitive potters. They make beautiful, beautiful work, and most of the materials that they use, their clays and their pigments and such, most of those come from nature in that surrounding country in Chihuahua, Mexico, but not all of them. This little pot here, for example, has green paint on it. Wow, that's pretty, people say. But you can't get green using natural minerals. This is a commercial underglaze product that's been painted on this pot. So while the clay and the temper in this pot are natural, are wild collected material, the green paint is not. 
And that's common in Mata Ortiz for them to use certain elements. Uh, those shiny black pots they make down there, for example, those use graphite that they purchase. So it's not something they collect in the local area. And so while every potter has to kind of make up their own mind about what kind of materials they're gonna use and how they're gonna work with those, there are many examples of successful primitive potters that do use commercial products. And a lot of times, especially when you're first getting started, it's good to go ahead and get started with commercial products and then try using wild products as you make progress. As you move forward, spend some time trying to locate wild clays and those kind of things and, and work towards that as a goal. So let's talk about collecting and processing wild clay. This is a spot where I collect wild clay frequently. Uh, it's a good clay that I use to make pots out of. All I do is, is dig it up, carry it home in a bucket, and then I grind it up in my corn grinder. Just a minute, I hear you say. The corn grinder is a piece of mechanized equipment and therefore not primitive. The corn grinder is not used to make pottery. The corn grinder is used to make material for making pottery. I also drive this clay home from the source where I dig it in my truck. And I use power tools to make gourd scrapers and paint brushes. So I do use mechanized tools to make the tools for making pottery. I just don't use mechanized tools to make the pottery itself. I add about 20% temper to it. Temper is just non-plastic material, so the easiest source of temper is like sand. So grind the clay up, add about 20% sand, and I do that by volume, so it's real easy to measure. 20% is just a four to one ratio. So after I've ground up the clay and I have the sand, I just do four scoops of the ground clay, one scoop of sand. Mix it up dry, that's my 20%. Then all I have to do is wet it and knead it, and I'm ready to go. Very simple. There's no reason to overcomplicate things. Although, you know, you're welcome to if you want to. A lot of potters do a lot more complicated processes. But let's keep it simple because this video is for beginners. Locate some clay, dry it out, grind it up, four scoops of clay, one scoop of sand, wet it and knead it, boom, you're off to the races. That's all you need. Now there's other things you can collect in the wild besides clay and sand. I have a lot of videos about wild clay and those kind of things and you can go a lot deeper on this subject. But let's talk a little bit about some of the other materials you can collect in the wild. Like minerals, for example, things that you would make paint out of. Uh, again, uh, you can go out and explore in your local area, maybe looking for tailing piles of old mines where you can find little bits of minerals that you can grind up and make into paint. But getting started, a lot of times it's good to just purchase those minerals on the internet first and then later go out and try to find wild substitutes. The main minerals I use for paint are, I use white clay for white paint. I use manganese dioxide for black paint. Sometimes I use copper carbonate for black paint. I use iron oxide for red paint. That's pretty much all I have. That is my entire palette of colors that I paint pottery with. And you can buy all those materials, red iron oxide, Copper carbonate and manganese dioxide are all available on Amazon, real inexpensively. An already ground too, so you don't have to go through the grinding and purifying process either. So that's a great way to get started. Okay, so I'm gonna collect some of this clay in my bucket, take it home, and then once we get back, let's talk a little bit about how I form pots, how to go about making those primitive pots. Now let's talk a little bit about how primitive pottery is formed. Let's talk about how it's made. I employ a technique called coil and scrape to form my pottery. That just means I'm building up the walls with coils and I'm using this gourd scraper to smooth them. If you look at primitive pottery around the world, you'll see that there's different techniques employed by different cultures to make pots. As long as it doesn't use any mechanized equipment, as long as it's one of those early types, then it's considered primitive pottery. Another popular technique here in the American Southwest is paddle and anvil and that's practiced by my friend Tony Soares. He has a whole YouTube channel with a lot of advice for people wanting to learn paddle and anvil pottery, and he teaches workshops. I'll put a link to Tony's stuff down in the doobly-doo, so make sure you check that out if you wanna learn more about paddle and anvil pottery. There's also pinch pots, which are just formed up from a lump of clay. There's something called a slow wheel that they used over in Europe, and there's a woman, I can't remember her name right now, who's I think in Poland, who practices that technique. She also has a few videos here on YouTube. I'll link up her channel in the doobly-doo as well. 
So there's a lot of resources out there for you to figure out how best to make pottery using primitive techniques, and there's a lot of different ways of doing it. So have fun just going out there and exploring the different types of primitive pottery and maybe figuring out which one you want to use. Now once the pot's formed, you can just fire it the way it is, or you can decorate it. I tend to focus on polychrome pottery, and that's just a fancy word that means it's painted with two or more colors. So the pots I make tend to be more brightly decorated. So if you're wanting to go that route, the first thing you're going to want to do is slip the pot. That is, cover it with a thin layer of a brightly colored clay, usually red or white. Once you've got a pot slipped, like this mug here, then you're going to want to smooth that slip, and you're going to do that using a smooth stone. You just pass it over the partially dried slip, and you get a nice glossy texture like I have here. After that, you may want to paint designs on it, and that involves making some paint. I primarily use two different kinds of paint that the ancients in my area used. I use mineral paint. This is made from stones that I go out and collect myself, and then I grind them up, and I mix that ground up mineral with a little bit of clay to make it harden in the fire, and I paint it on the pot. That's mineral paint. The other kind I use is organic paint. This is just a plant that's boiled down into a thick syrup and painted on the pot. And with the right slip, in the right firing environment, that can turn into black carbon designs on the finished pot. So again, there's a lot of decisions for an individual artist to make on how they want to go about making the pot, how they want to decorate it, what kinds of materials they want to use for decorating. And again, there's a lot of different options for going out and collecting your own materials or just buying them online until you can find some in the wild yourself. Now, when it comes to learning primitive pottery, it can be very difficult. I know when I was a young man and I was trying to learn this, there weren't a lot of resources out there. So you've got a couple of different options. You can take a workshop. There's a number of different potters that teach workshops. I teach a few workshops every year, usually in the spring and fall. And so that's one, but there's other potters that teach workshops. Tony Sora is who I mentioned earlier, teaches workshops out in California. Uh, my friend Kelly Magleby, who lives up in Utah, she teaches workshops all the time. She probably teaches a different workshop every month. So that's another one. I'll link up Kelly's website down in the doobly-doo where you can find out about upcoming workshops that she has. So there's a number of different potters who are teaching workshops, at least here in the American Southwest. And I'm sure there's other ones, you know, around the country and around the world. Now, if you can't afford one of these workshops, workshops can be hundreds of dollars in price. And the travel on top of that adds to the cost. Uh, there are online options. I have online master classes available on my website, four different classes, one for wild clays, another for natural paint slips and pigments, one for coil pottery making, and another for outdoor pottery firing. So you can get all those skills that are required to make primitive pottery yourself from your computer at home using those master classes. And I have a bundle of those available, which combines all four of those classes for a reduced price. So that's a great option for somebody just starting out in primitive pottery. So I wanna take a second to encourage you to look at some other primitive potters that are out there. Uh, I've made a few videos about some other potters. Clint Swink, Tori Hoops, Bobby Silas, John Olson, and Tony Soares are all potters that I've featured in videos in the past. Go check them out. Some of these people have other material out there. For example, Tony has his own YouTube channel. Clint Swink has a website. These are great ways to learn more about these potters. So here are a few other primitive potters that you might want to become aware of. Pascal Balder, I, I might be butchering his name. Uh, he's a fantastic primitive potter and he does work with primitive glazes. And I think he also does a lot of cooking and pickling in his pottery. So check him out. I'll put that link down in the doobly-doo. The potters of Mata Ortiz are a great source of inspiration for primitive pottery. If you look at the quality of their work, it's hard to believe they're using primitive techniques to get this fine a quality. Specifically, I'm gonna direct you to the work of Diego Valles who is a personal friend of mine. He's come up and done demonstrations at the Southwest Kiln Conference in the past, and he speaks excellent English. So he's a good resource if you want to reach out to somebody down there, because a lot of the potters down in Mata Ortiz don't speak English. Ron Carlos is a Maricopa potter. He lives on the Salt River Pima Maricopa Reservation in central Arizona. He's an excellent potter, and one of the main people who have been trying to teach the younger generation pottery in his community. The Herd Museum made an excellent video about Ron Carlos a couple years back, and I'll put the link to that down in the doobly-doo as well, which kind of highlights his work. So now, hopefully you have something to think about regarding other primitive potters out there, and other kind of directions you could possibly take primitive pottery. 
But before we wrap up here, I want to talk about firing pottery, because that's really where the rubber meets the road. That's where your art becomes ceramic, becomes permanent. And that's also one of the hardest steps to get right. So let's spend a little time talking about firing pottery using primitive methods. Okay, so when it comes to firing, there's, okay, wait. I know throughout this video, I've told you there's a million different ways to do something. And I'm gonna say it again. When it comes to firing, there's a million different ways to do it. And, and I don't mean to overuse that, but it's, it's true. There, there literally are, and, and you can go on the internet and you can look at different ways of firing pottery. Uh, YouTube's a great example for this, and you can find people firing in all different ways. And I'm not talking about electric, gas, or traditional wood kilns, just alternative firing techniques. Look at the way native people in India fire their pottery. Look at the way native people in Africa fire their pottery. Look at the way the Native Americans in North and South America fire their pottery. And, and, and each one of those worlds, say Africa, for example, or South America, you will find dozens and dozens of different ways of firing pottery. Uh, and so in a worldwide scale, there, there literally are many, many, many ways to fire your pottery without using a traditional kiln. I've tried several different ways, and, and I really like just the surface fire, just the TP type uh, arrangement of fuel around the pot on the surface of the ground. To me, that works really good. Uh, I build up a bed of coals, uh, while the coals are building up, while that, what we call the primary fire is burning, I stack the pots around that so they can preheat, kind of warm them up, drive off any remaining moisture that might be in that clay body. Once that bed of coals is established and the pots are thoroughly heated, I stack those pots upside down over those coals. Then I arrange a layer of wood in teepee fashion around that pile of pottery and I light it off. Usually that much wood is enough to bring this from mud to ceramics. Uh, in some cases, I have to add a little extra wood. It's good to kind of monitor your firing temperature to know whether you've gotten hot enough. I'd usually use an infrared thermometer to do that, but again, that's not really a primitive tool. Uh, and so you can do it without that. And you can learn little tricks for looking in the fire and observing the pottery and using that to tell you something about how hot you've gotten. So let's talk about the way other people fire. If you go to the Southwest Kiln Conference, this is held every year somewhere around the Southwest. This year, it's gonna be in Blanding, Utah, September 29th to October 1st. So if you're really interested in learning this, make arrangements to go to the Southwest Kiln Conference. If you want more information on that, the address is swkiln.com. I'll put the link in the doobly-doo as well as on the screen for that. But if you go to the Southwest Kiln Conference, you'll see people firing in a variety of styles. Uh, usually there is what they call a trench kiln, an Anazazi trench kiln, which is a big rectangular trench sunk into the ground, lined with stones in which the pottery is stacked, wood is stacked over the top of that and fired, and then the whole thing is smothered with earth until the next day. That's a great way to learn to fire in a reduction atmosphere. That is to not oxidize those irons in the pottery to make your whites really white. Some people fire in a shallow pit. I've done that myself quite a bit. Some people fire in primitive kilns, adobe kilns or brick kilns. I have some videos on that. Some people fire with grass or choya wood. Some people fire with mesquite or oak. Some people stack the fuel in teepee style. Some people lay it up log cabin style. Some people use cow manure. I've done that as well. There's just a million different options. You're welcome to look at my videos. I have a lot of videos about firing pottery and different ways to fire pottery. And I'll link some of that down in the doobly-doo. But as I said, there's other artists, there's other ways of doing it. Figure out what works best for you. In the end, to turn mud into ceramics, all you have to do is get it up to about 650 or 700 degrees Celsius. Now that's a lot hotter than you're gonna get in your oven, but it's really not that hot compared to what you usually get in like a campfire. So think about how you build a fire Find a safe place to do it and start experimenting with it. It really isn't that hard once you figure it out. And if you need a little help, there's my online masterclass. There's a lot of videos that are online as well as that Southwest Kiln Conference coming up in the fall. If you'd like to see some of the different firings that take place at the Southwest Kiln Conference, I made a video at the last one in Blanding, Utah, and I'll link that up right over here. So go check that out. Look at some of the different firing techniques that people were using and get some ideas. I appreciate you watching today. I'll catch you next time.